but a lot of them are. Now there's a lot. Of okay, got it. Okay, so uh, what what the other thing that I was going to mention is this keeps changing as people look more and more into it. There used to be a big, you know, the big discoveries when I find out that uh, that that uh, that there was all these interconnections and how uh, you know, the mycorrhizal fungi can really uh, help the tree by adding, uh, you know, by adding to the the root structure and so forth, and add, you know, adding to not just that, but connecting to other nearby trees that may benefit from it or stealing from it, regardless, what was called the wood wide web, right? And so the wood wide web now has come under some discussion because it has not come under uh, direct scientific uh, uh, proof, just a few studies that this is how it goes. So people are still trying to real uh, to kind of see just where these, uh, you know, where these different relationships are, how important they are. Does it differ by species? Does it differ by ecosystems? Does it differ, you know, that sort of thing. But we do understand that, yes, there is some kind of positive association this there and that that's, that's, you know, unmistakable. Whether or not, you know, one tree, an older tree helps the younger one or whatever, that's kind of one of those things that people are still discussing out there. But just so you know, it's still under great discussion, but it is kind of neat that people discovered this and they realize, okay, it's not as simple as, as what you think. All right, on to the next slide, please. So some things only exist because of these different connections. So an old thing, you know, an old naturalist saying, when an algae takes a lichen to a fungus, that's what forms a fungus. Or now we know it's not just, a, 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 you know, it's not just a, Algae can also be a cyanobacteria. But regardless, when you put those two things together, you come up with a brand new type of organism. You know, all the different kinds of lichens that are out there that um, are a combination of both of them. By, by, by themselves, they don't really exist, but or, or they exist, but not, not in the same way that we view them. But when you put them together, that makes for a completely new way of looking at things, a completely new way of looking at this different organism. And, you know, it's a very simplistic way of looking to it, but one that, uh, you know, that serves as well as at least getting a general understanding of it. On to the next one, please. So let's look at a couple of interesting things. And we're going to look here at mycoheterotrophs. And so here, what we're looking at are what was originally the case where people always find and say, oh, wow, this is this plant is very, very important, but it's always associated with certain things. So pine sap was always associated with pine trees. Beech dropped rose always associated with beech trees. And so we used to think that that was the case. And then more and more people realize, are realizing that it's not as simple as that. So, for example, where they used to think, OK, uh, the, the pine sap, the plant itself, is actually parasitizing the pine trees and the beech drops are paralyzing the beech trees, we find out it's not as simple as that. In fact, we find out that probably closer to the truth is that it's actually more of a menage a trois because what ends up happening is you need the fungi in there. So you, you, need, the, uh, you need the original host, which in this case, in pines, that would be pines, beech trees would, would, would be beeches, yeah, Indian pipes would be oaks, whatever the case may be, right? And so you start with that, and then the certain species of fungus associated then, um, you know, is connected to the tree. And then the other, these other hosts then come in there and they are connected to the actual fungi themselves. In many cases, and people are still studying this, it's that they are actually taking food from the, uh, they're actually mining, as it were, the, um, the, uh, the actual fungi themselves. And so that's why they think that these are mycorrhizal cheaters. Mycorrhizal uh, association of funguses are the main ones that we associate as being a positive type of thing with different trees. And so these guys are stealing from the fungi in order to help themselves. When they do that, that means that there is no use for them um, having to be photosynthetic anymore. No reason, because they're getting really the moisture and 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 you know the elements that need to survive from the actual roots of the of the host uh, the host uh, tree, and that then is is passed on to the fungi. Um, but there is a big problem with that, and that is because if you're existing underground amongst the, the mycorrhizal uh, roots that are tied in with, with the that are tied in with with, with the plant roots themselves. Um, there, you you're, you really cannot pollinate yourself. You can't spread your seeds that way. Uh, water's not that efficient at doing it. It's not good at spreading, at spreading uh, pollen from one way to another. So once a year or 
but sometimes once after many years, depending on how um, how healthy the plant is or whatever, the plant has to send up a structure above ground that then becomes what we would consider a normal type of flowering structure, a flower as it were. The flower then attracts pollinators who then pass it from one place to another. The, the stem is still up above there. So the wind or whatever can carry the, you know, the seeds to brand new locations where again, if they meet the proper stimulus, if there's again, the right host and the right fungi, then it can start all over again. And that is what they think is the main reason be, 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 um, how these different things kind of go. Now, there's some more studies. This is always the case. Somebody proposes something that seems very reasonable, whatever, and then people start to poke holes in it. And that's the way science works, right? And so they're doing more and more studies to see whether this is truly the way that it works or not. But basically, these non-photosynthetic plants, and these are all plants, okay? And they look like fungi, especially like Indian pipes and things like that, but they're all flowering plants. Um, they they only send up their flowering structures uh, in or you know out of the ground. Uh, when they need to do so and in some cases don't do it every year so anyway these are mycorrhizal cheaters a very neat way and again you depend on three different things you got to have the host first then you have to have the right type of fungi and then if if a seed or if a seed of one of these different plants comes in contact with the proper place and it's allowed to grow then it forms its own roots it, it, it forms its own root system and so forth and so you need all three of them for this thing to survive all of them are part of one very small puzzle where they got to be the dependent on each other. Okay. Um, uh, onto one more and then I'll stop for questions, but, uh, but just one more, please. So there is also another thing, go hemoparasite. These are what you, when you don't depend on everything from something else, like in this case, what, what, what the ones we were looking over there, the mycorrhizal cheaters, they're taking everything that they really need from other, from other places, right? This, on the other hand, only obtain a little piece of it. A good example would be mistletoe, where mistletoe yes it uses the, tr the the tree structure you get above ground or whatever and uh, and it, and it still steals some some especially water and some nutrients from the host itself but in reality it's forming most of its own photosynthesis as a green plant uh that's just attached to the tree itself it it still depends on the tree for lots of different things and then after it flowers it produces fruits birds carry it on you know carry the sticky seeds from one plant to another and it starts all over again but these only, um, again, it, it's it's not a two parasite one way or the other. It only gets a piece of what it needs from everything else. And that's where mistletoe kind of comes in place. So it's another type of relationship. Yes, it is still dependent on, uh, on other things. It's still connected to something else, but not to the extent that we're seeing with the previous uh, slide that we just saw. Okay. And actually one more, and then we'll stop a question. Sorry, I, I, I realized that there's there's one more thing that we won't mention. And now that I kind of wrap Oh, okay. I, I, for whatever reason, we may have skipped it. Um, we, there, there was there was one more thing that I want to mention, and that was basically lady slipper orchids. And lady slipper orchids, they um, they I, for some reason I got dropped out of sites. Lady slipper orchids are a good example of how um, how plants are really truly dependent on something else because uh, if and this happens uh, a lot with our many of our terrestrial orchids. Some are much more. Um, uh, relying on, on fungi than others. But if you were to go there and you dig up, let's say, lady slippers, and people have done this all the time, and they take it somewhere else, you basically have killed the plant, okay? Because you are disconnecting all the fungal structures, everything like that, that the plant needs, and that is it. Usually, uh, unless there's already existing fungus in where you're taking it to, you cannot dig enough fungi that is going to survive. And so it'll survive for a little bit, might even survive for a few months, this and that, whatever. But eventually you have killed the plant because you took it out of its connection with the rest of the world in this case. And that is very true of many of our of our, uh, of our terrestrial orchids uh, that we have here in North America, um, especially lady slippers, although in some cases, uh, some plants are a little bit more forgiving than the others. So like, for example, the more common um, the more common orchids that we have around here um, that really you know don't uh, are are much more forgiving about it than, for example, lady slippers, which are very very exact about what they do. Okay, so anyways, before we go on to the next thing, are there any questions just about this little basic thing that we mentioned? Otherwise, we'll get on to uh, host plants and and how butterflies and everything depend on them too. Yeah, nothing in the chat yet. Excellent. So there we go. On to the next one then. Okay, so let's talk about left after host plants. And this is something a lot of people understand or or have heard about or whatever. And we'll look at that very, very common um, you know, example that's always given. Okay. So 
So Lepidoptera are basically butterflies and moths, and butterflies and moths start off their life as caterpillars, right? Well, eggs and then caterpillars. And um, for many of them, they have to be fairly exact of which host plant, what plant they lay their eggs onto. It's pretty interesting how they do this. So for example, if you were a typical monarch butterfly, you fly around, you see what may look like the proper plant, you land on the plant, and then if, if, if this is true of many, of many butterflies, okay? They sit on the plant and then they drum it. They take their legs and they stamp on there, which breaks up the surface enough so that they can taste what's in there. If they get the right taste as to what it is, then they say, okay, I got the right plant and I can then lay my egg there because that that's going to, it, it is the proper one that my, uh, you know, my generation, my, um, you know, my, that my caterpillars are going to need in order to survive. So for monarch butterflies, it's things in the milkweed family. It's not just a sclepius. It's not one family. Everyone just thinks it's only milkweeds, whatever. It's not. It's the milkweed family. There's a couple of them, some vines and things like that, which are not a sclepius. But regardless, it's the same family. And they lay their eggs. There you go. And that's kind of how it starts all, uh, over again. They, they really do need this to some different extent. Um, and some are more forgiving than others. Some, especially some moths are a little bit more Catholic in their taste. They can take a lot of different kinds of plants, but others are very, very specific. Okay. The zebra swallowtail only uses pawpaw and that's it. If you don't have pawpaw, you don't have zebra swallowtails. So it can be that way. And that the raptor hosts are very, very important because it's one that we all can see in every different way. And this affects so many more things. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later on, but I'll just mention it here. And then when we mention it again later, it will reinforce it. So when you have this, and this is something that Doug Tallamy and, 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 and other entomologists have looked at, uh, they realize just how important uh, these sorts of things are. So as an example, with, uh, with, with uh, butterflies and moths, the caterpillars that these things feed on uh, then support, you know, 96% uh, of our land birds, or our terrestrial birds, which feed especially uh, caterpillars, which is like little protein packets to their young. So if if you, while the the, uh, the adult themselves may feed on other types of things, like hummingbirds, yes, you know that they feed on, you know, nectar and so forth, but they feed, and in some cases, uh, some studies have shown up to 80% of the food that they give their young are actually insects, okay? So they need protein in order to develop, and that's true of most, not all, but most species of them. That's the 96% of, of land birds, okay? And not only that, but other things depend on these too. A good example would be that in the east, uh, uh, here in the east of, of, of the United States, we have 18 species of bats, okay? All of them feed on insects, and the number one insect that they feed on are moths. And what are moths? Adult caterpillars. So again, when you get one little piece like this, it connects everything else. And I will, I'll mention that again. And this is an important little piece that I'm mentioning here. So we'll mention it again as we as we continue on. But on to the next slide, please. So when you plant for something, let's say a lot of people know this. Now, okay, yes, uh, we, uh, as you may, may or may not know, uh, here in in Arlington County, where we're recognized as, as one of the uh, one of the leaders again in um, in the Mayor's Monarch Watch, we signed a, a program several years ago where we had to do a lot. There's like twenty some different things you have to do. We're considered one of the elite counties because we do I think over seventeen different kinds of things as far as planting milkweeds and our planting plans, supplying you know supplying free seed for others like our nature centers do all sorts of different kinds of things that we do support milkweeds, which is great. And the reason we do that, and when we mention this, it's not just for monarchs. A lot of people, oh, you're planting milkweed just for monarchs. It's way more than that. We see monarchs as, as, a, as a signature species. It's basically the flagship species because when we plant for monarchs, we're actually feeding many other things. And this is an example of all the many other things. In reality, milkweed is not that great for, support, for, for uh, supporting other kinds of um, other kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of caterpillars. There's only 12 different kinds of lepidoptera, meaning uh, caterpillars that feed on them. And most of them are not found locally. Many of them are in the South. So in reality, when you plant milkweed, you're not feeding as much as you would be uh, with other things. So one of the ones that I always hear about is uh, people ask, hey, I have this, they send me a picture, you know, my capital natural group. Hey, is this milkweed? And it turns out to be dog vein. It's, oh, I'm gonna yank it out. So, well, why would you yank it out? So, well, it doesn't help, it doesn't help the monarchs. I'm like, well, look at it this way. Here we are. We have the milkweed. So it, it supports 12 different species of caterpillars, some, most of which are not local. On the other hand, when you look at dogbane, it supports 22 species. So if you argue about this, which one really helps more species of caterpillars, milkweed or dogbane? 
But because monarchs are so charismatic and because people are familiar with it, that's the one that wins and people yank out what's a very good native plant that supports many, many other species and they get rid of it. But here it just shows you some of the many creatures that also depend on. I do a whole hour long program on a milkweed safari and then we talk about it, the history and everything else or whatever. But just, you know, this is just a quick wrap up of how how many different things. In fact, uh, in some studies show over 124 different species have some kind of association with milkweeds. Anyways, on to the next slide, please. So here's the dog bane. And again, we look at it and we say, okay, you know, it, it supports 22 species of, of, of caterpillar. It's all good and dandy. It's a wonderful plant. And we, we, I used to do a lot of butterfly surveys and stuff like that. And again, we're five plants we always look for when, when, when we're doing these cats, you know, and one of them was dog bane. It would feed a lot of the smaller skippers and things like that. Now, so we know it's important or whatever. We also can't, uh, we also need to understand something else. And that is that people are part of the puzzle. I mean, we always think, oh, it's nature. And then it's us. We, we were, we were part of nature. We have been for the longest time. We still depend on, on it in so many different ways, which is why, you know, Arlington is now, you know, part of the biophilic network and things like that. So that's all good and dandy. And just some ways that people used to use it for, it's been used medicinally, as I, as I mentioned, uh, it, it, I should say this, this, uh, this genus has been used medicinally and has been used uh, in, in particular for, by the native, uh, the native people here for all sorts of things, including the primary thing uh, for making the best cordage. We have about 40 some different species, local species that they use for making cordage, making rope. And the strongest material they have is dog bean, which is also called Indian hemp for that reason. So there's lots of different things. And there's a whole, I just did an ethnobotany walk on Saturday over at the Native American Festival over at Riverbend. And the whole idea is we're talking about how people, you know, depended on these things. And so this little side is stuck in here. One, because it ties in nicely with the monarch slide and so forth, so that we don't want to ignore one thing or another because it's still beneficial, but also to show that people are part of it, even if we don't understand or we've lost some of these connections that we used to have with that. Okay, on to the next slide, please. So can anyone see what's going on over here? And again, unfortunately, you probably cannot see my, I'm assuming you can't see my cursor because right now I'm circling something. I'm guessing you're not, but, but at the bottom of the, in the middle of, of the picture at the very, very bottom of the flower. Yep. Right there. You just touch it right. There is a crab spider. We have two different species of crab spider. We can change color depending on what plant that they're on. Um, and I, I can't, this is not a good enough picture for me to tell you which of the two, that, which of the two that, that it is. But anyways, here it is. And here's the other thing. I, you know, I can tell you that all, all these caterpillars feed on it and you look by them, you go by a milkweed plant. There's all of these other things to also, whatever. The thing is, you probably will not even notice that they're out there. And that is that um, most of these animals, their main defense is camouflage and they're trying to hide from what's going on. They don't want to get eaten by something else and this, that, whatever. So you may plant something and you think, okay, I planted milkweed. And maybe if you don't know any, any further, answer, oh, for the monarchs. And that's all you cared about. But in reality, you're also helping out everything else. Now, you may not notice those things are in there, but that does not mean that you're not helping them. So the good thing is, and that's why, you know, Arlington County uh, signed on to the, the Mayor's Monarch Watch uh, you know, city as, is that uh, we were using as a flagship uh, type of thing where, look, yes, you plant something because you think that's the only thing you're helping, but in reality, it helps so much more. And this is kind of what it is. You a lot of times do not notice all the different things you're doing here. In this case, here is a crab spider, okay, and uh, and... It's one of those two species I mentioned, uh, and what it's doing is, of course, it can change color to match the flower, and it is waiting for something to come in there, hidden away, so they can feed itself and so on. Um, so it's a kind of a neat little thing. Uh, any questions before I continue on as far as what we've, we've very briefly discussed here? There was a comment in the chat yes. from one of our listeners that their daughter wants to have dog bane as a fiber source. Is it a good fiber source? <laughs> it's a great fiber source, but but you need a couple of things about it. So first of all, um, dog bane spreads. It's one another name for it. There's a couple of different species. Is spreading dog bane because it spreads, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, by rhizomes. So it keeps spreading. So if you plant in one place, it'll continue to spread. Uh, the other thing about it is that much like milkweed, uh, it is toxic. It's in the same family as milkweed, although it doesn't support monarchs per se. Um, so that the toxin that's in there is is uh, is an is an issue because uh, and this is true of milkweed too if you were out there and this has happened in some schools where they go out there and they they cut the milkweed in order to, to raise the caterpillars in you know in their schoolyard or whatever 
and then they get the sap on them and they're not noticing and they rub their eyes and now the sap has gotten their eyes and you can actually, believe it or not, be temporarily blinded by it. So the, there is a toxin there. It protects the plant from being eaten, which is why there's only 22 species on dog bean and only 12 species on, on milkweed or caterpillars to feed on it. Um, but uh, so there is that. So if you're making it, uh, you have to do it in the fall when many of the toxins out there, you let it dry. You have to do it in the right process or whatever, because otherwise you're going to get the sap all over you. And it's very easy for you to make a mistake or do something like that, either in chest or to put your eyeball in your eyes or something like that. So, of course, it's very possible to do. Native people did it for the longest time. People, you know, they survived as one of our many kinds of, uh, you know, uh, cordage uh, materials. But, you know, you have to realize that there are some, there are some, things to, that uh, you have to realize about how this plant protects itself too. And in this case, it is toxic to many different kinds of things. Okay, on to the next slide then. The back one, oh yeah, I know it's difficult. So again, here's what I mentioned before. So 96% of our land birds, terrestrial birds, feed their young caterpillars and soft flies too, which look like caterpillars, except they're really more related to uh, wasps and, and uh, they're really more related to to wasps and bees than anything else that is their major food source and the number one thing in fact some people claim that the reason we have migration is thanks to the the wonderful perfusion of especially caterpillars we have where a, a lot of birds can take the cold so it's not that they're leaving because the cold is too much for them they're really leaving because their main food source the caterpillars are starting to uh, to die out in the in the in the in the fall. So they leave in order to to, to go uh, after their food supply. They leave in these big groups, go down to the south where it's all sunny, whatever. However, they will risk coming back all the way back here again because they don't want to compete with all the other species of birds which are in south, uh, in the south and in in the tropics and so forth. So they're willing to risk it to come back here with perfect timing of when the caterpillars are starting to come out. So that's very very important because. If we didn't have uh, caterpillars and so forth, we probably would not have the the wonderful phenomenon of of uh, migration as well. In this case, here's some. This is taken at Barcroft Park. Here's a, you know here is a, a common grackle, and look at how many caterpillars there are next to it. Those are fall canker worms, which again, some people you know it is a native animal and uh, and so forth. But there there have been some uh, some talk about trying to control them, this and that. Won't go into the politics behind that. Uh, we you know. But, uh, but but they can't overwhelm a forest, right? But when they do have a big boon, and this is the case here, when there's tons of them, then my goodness, the birds all feed like, feed like crazy. We had a big boom of them a few years back. There were tons and tons of them. And my goodness, every bird that could feed on them had wonderful nesting success. And that's kind of how it goes. And then I already mentioned, our bats also depend on them. Okay, on to the next one then. So all of this is what's being uh, talked about basically in uh, in uh, Doug Tallamy's and some of the big books that he's written and so forth. I encourage you to read them because there's lots of stuff in there, but it kind of encapsulates it. I will mention some of the other things that, that he did it. And if I could do a special little plug, um, the latest book he did is The Nature of Oaks. And I'll talk about why oaks are so important. But I will also mention that I had the honor, I, I sometimes host the, uh, the Native Plant Podcast, you know, John McGee's uh, pod, uh, podcast. And uh, and I was lucky enough that he invited me because he, he but because you know my association with you, you some of the stuff of work that uh, Doug Tallamy have had to actually interview him for a talk about uh, his book that had just come out, The Nature of Oaks. So you're welcome to look at the Native Plant Podcast on Oaks about Doug Tallamy. It's a neat little thing. But again, it, it does talk about, uh, I'm only going to mention a couple of things, but just how much other things that there are. The other thing is, uh, I'm actually do want to get back in touch with Doug Tallamy because I, I find some other things that he may not have looked at that I'm really hoping he takes account when he's when he does the rewrite of, of the Oak book itself. But anyways, on to the next one. So here we look at something. I want to compare something here. That is the, the native plants. And uh, these are some of the top 10, you know, top few native plants versus some of the more commonly planted plants that are that are planted out there. And again, the reason that, you know, you really want to plant native plants and so forth is because they um, they support so much more, way more um, wildlife than anything else. And even if you're only looking at the number of caterpillars to support that then support 96 percent of our birds and all of our bats, whatever, even if you only stop there, it's still remarkable. On the other hand, you look at some of the commonly planted stuff and you find out that it really supports almost nothing. OK, so 
Uh, we look at some numbers on the left, okay, with native woody plants, native perennial plants, and you see their way up there, and you look at some of the more commonly planted uh, plants that are out there, and you realize there's just no comparison. Two you have them, which we know is a is a big invasive, and it supports the spotted lanternfly and so forth. You know, two of these are non-native, plus then you have the spotted lanternfly in there as well. Not good. Uh, you get, you, know, you, you look at something like bamboo, and only, there's only one kind of caterpillar feeds on it. Butterfly bush, always touted as a wonderful pollinator plant. But when it's not in bloom, it's just taking up space, competing with everything else, and not supporting anything. One species of caterpillar uses butterfly bush. So outside of its bloom time, it's really not that great of a plant. Okay, and you look right down the line. And same thing happens with, uh, you know, with many of the other. So here we look at trees, we also look at... Uh, you know, you look at, uh, at at perennials. And again, the bottom line is you want to plant the plants and eat the plants that once that not only are adapted to the local conditions that we have, but also evolved with the different kinds of wildlife because it supports so much more of them. Whereas in the stuff that we choose to plant or something like that, because it didn't evolve with anything in here, frankly, most of it does not support very much. And so we can be good neighbors, we can be good stewards or whatever, by just rethinking about planting more native plants um, than, uh, you know, than non-natives, and we can go a long ways to preserving habitat. And, you know, Doug Tallamy talks about that in some of his books. On to the next one, please. So here is an example. So one of his students, um, um, and um, who, who lives locally, did a study. It was mostly taking place in, in Baltimore as well as the D.C. area. And they basically looked at very, very common bird species, the Carolina chickadee, which we have all over the place. Most of you guys have seen that, whatever. They chose it for two reasons, one of which it's very, very common. Second of all, it's, they know it can survive near people. And uh, it's not exclusively just an insect feeder. It also feeds on bird seed and so forth. So they used this as, as a primary example. They looked at it and they found out, wow, it really depends, even though it's an adaptable bird. And even though, you know, you, you think that we can we can raise it one way or another just by putting bird feeders or whatever, that is not the case. Because in its nesting territory, if 70% is not native biomass, then guess what? It does not succeed very well. If it's not at least 70%, then most of them don't, don't survive. Less Less than that 70% means there's a 60% less chance that they will even try to breed because it's useless for them to try to do it. Those nests that are built that are less than 70% have 1.5 fewer eggs and 1.2 fledglings that survive. Many of them, it take a, a long time for them to mature in order to do them. They're less weight, less capable of sustaining themselves. And the bottom line is they cannot support a population. So you're like, oh, well, okay, well, I'll just put bird feeders up, right? They did that. And the the, the main researcher first, Desiree on Narango, she, when she put it out there, she realized something there. And that was, okay, in some places where people were feeding birds, you'd think, okay, fine. They don't have the caterpillars. They'll just feed on the bird seed, right? No, not even close. Because they found out that those, that those that were attempting to do so, that were looking at less than ideal food. And the less than ideal food goes from, if there's no caterpillars, they switch to something else, including spiders. But spiders aren't great food. So there's less and less things. Those that fed exclusively on seeds because they couldn't find anything else was a disaster. They actually found some of the nestlings and their crops, which is where they store the food, were full of bird seed, but they were dead. Why? Because bird seed does not supply them with what they need to survive. Bird feeders doesn't help at all. Bird feeders are more for people to watch birds, but in reality, they really don't help the birds very much at all unless there's a severe winter or something like that. So again, the magic number that we think of for at least Carolina chickadees is 70% of, of, the, of the bird's territory, okay, being native plants. And again, it takes about 9,120 insects, mostly caterpillars, to raise one brood of three little, uh, th three little uh, uh, chickadees, okay? So that's just an example of kind of how it goes. So if, if, if there are any questions, I'll, con uh, I'll continue on, but if there are any questions about some of the stuff that I mentioned now about the importance of native plants, as well as how dependent they are on certain, de these interconnections of, uh, a lep of uh, host plants and so forth. All good then. Okay, let's continue on to the next one then. So, so one of the big things that uh, the town he points out is uh, it, in one of his books that he wants to consider what's considered a homegrown national park, because he realized that 
parkland by itself is not going to be enough to support them. You look at Arlington County, we're a built up area, whatever, 40% built up, this, that, whatever. Um, and we realized that at less than 6% and really 4.4% 4, 4 uh, of our parks being natural parks, there is not no way that the that that small percentage will support um, will support any kind of uh, enough wildlife. It just can't do it. So we really have to depend on people. And what Taramie points out that if you if you look at the uh, you know the entirety of how much property is not owned by parks, it out it outweighs any of the largest national parks we have uh, together. Okay, and so you can be part of what he calls the homegrown national park. You plant native plants, you sign a pledge to do so, whatever, and then that goes a long ways as preserving wildlife habitat and helping wildlife, okay? And so, again, you may plant it because it's a pretty plant, you may plant it, whatever, but as long as you're planting native plants, you help everything else. But here's the thing, it's like, oh my God, you know, here in, in this area, there is probably 1,600 different kinds of native plants, both woody plants and, non, and non-woody plants that exist around here. And it's like, well, no way we can put it there. Or my yard is so small, there's no way I can put more even one oak tree would have a hard time surviving in my yard, that sort of thing. But then we realize that um, he points out what are keystone species. It turns out that a very small percentage of the genus, okay, of, of the genera, 5%, support three quarters of the caterpillar species. And so by picking and choosing, and again, it's great to have a diversity, and it's good to have more of different kinds of plants. But if you're careful about which species you plant, you can go a long ways. So here we'll look at example. Willows is a good one because not only to support a ton of different kinds of caterpillars, but also sawflies, like you can see right over here, as well as many kinds of gall, galls and whatever. 455 are just caterpillars, for example. That's a keystone species. If you look at smaller plants, in this case, let's look at um, let's look at asters, which are commonly planted in the fall for for beauty and so forth. 112 species, and much more than that. We we may be able to. By the time I'll talk a bit later about all the other stuff that also feed on it too. Cherries, 456 different species, including many gall makers that then support other things. A good example is the cherry azure gall. At one point, people thought that, okay, we had a spring azure, which is a little blue butterfly, and that was it. Now we're realizing there's at least five different species. There's a spring azure, there's a summer azure, there's a holly azure. And then we find out that there's one that only lives on the, the galls, these edible homes that are formed on cherries. So you need to have the cherry, then you need to have the gall maker, and then you can have the butterflies. Again, you don't have all of those, you don't have the cherry azure butterfly. So again, it's all kind of interconnected. You, there's lots of different places out there. But the bottom line is, you look at the main plants, you plant those, you're going a long ways, even if you don't have the space for supporting many of the other kinds of plants that you may want to support. Okay, on to the next one, please. Well, Alonzo, I've got one question for okay, you. Okay, please. Um, what's a keystone plant that is out very, very early spring, late winter? Like, I look so, at my yard, and the only thing I see coming up that early are daffodils. Yeah. What, but, I mean, it's full of native plants. But what are some things that help at that early time? Sure, because uh, the ones I've mentioned over here, because they have a longer time to grow, thus they support more species, you know, the asters and goldenrods. However, early on, a good example would be something that that, that supports more than one thing. So I, uh, uh, let's look at it at, in like a wholesale, uh, a whole scale type of thing. So spring beauties, for example, okay, Claytonia. We have both uh, we have both Carolina and Virginia, the, the two species, whatever, mostly for Virginia uh, spring beauties. They, they have been... Uh, studied and, and we haven't studied a ton of the early spring wildflowers but they support more different kinds of pollinators than any other plant that's been studied so far that we have out there so granted it's an ephemeral it comes up the trees leaf out and disappears on you but in that short period of time it supports a ton of different kinds of pollinator species that come to them including and i'll talk about illegal lactic species a particular kind of bee that only lives where spring beauties are, which means if you don't have spring beauties, you don't have that bee. That's just kind of how it is. That's how interconnected it is, okay? So spring beauties, um, you know, you can plant them underneath the other trees, the trees leaf out, whatever the case may be, there you go. And granted, um, you know, they, they may form some, uh, you know, they have just a brief uh, bloom, bloom time or whatever, but in reality, they support a ton of different kinds of, of, uh, of uh, creatures, uh, you know, pollinators and so forth in the meantime. 
Um, so, you know, that's just one example of another of, of a very simple kind of plant that may support something, even though you may not notice all the different things that it supports while it's in while it's in a short little time of bloom. Each flower only blooms for about seven days. So it, it's not like it, it blooms a ton. But during those seven days, it's very, very attractive to a bunch of different things. And because as a species, it only has seven days that, well, you know, that that it, that uh, that an individual flower being bloomed. But as uh, I'm sorry, as an individual, but as a species, it can go a couple of months, you know, uh, late February into the very, very last parts of April, early May, even they could be in bloom. And because it's such a long blooming time, it, it supports a ton of different kinds of pollinators. So that would be a good a good one, I think, of a, of a good example of an early blooming thing that you would think does not support a lot because it's not out for very long or whatever, but it does uh, something like that more long lasting like ragworts. And I don't know if I pulled that slide out of here because I had a lot of slides that I pulled out of here just because I try to make it more tree related <laughs> rather than, than, you know, other types of things. But golden ragworts are another one. An evergreen species that can put, go on in there, supports, I think it's, I uh, can't remember how many different species of caterpillars now. Hopefully I can pull it out of there. But anyways, that's a good one there because it supports that as well as, um, you know, and it's, it, and it's an evergreen thing that can survive underneath your trees in most cases as long as it's kind of moist so uh, there are lots of different plants that you may not notice everything that it has um, the reason that these other plants support so much more is that one there's a ton of different species to make up the asters or the golden rods okay but also they last such a long long period of time that during that whole time they support a lot more than an ephemeral plant that comes up the trees leaf out and disappears therefore you know it supports a lot more because it's out there uh, for the longer period of time. I don't know if that, that explained things all that well. But if if so, then let's move on to the next, on to the next slide then. So let's look at a keystone species and let's just look at Quercus, the mighty oak, okay? So we found out that it has 40 different kinds of mammal species that's, that, that feed on this genus, just the oaks themselves okay 40 different species 60 plus different kinds of birds that also feed on the acorns there are 61 different kinds of wood-borne beetles that live within the tree itself 21 leaf hoppers um 550 cinnipid gall wasps but that's out of 805 different kind of gall species that survive on on them themselves 557 caterpillar species plus 37 tree sopper species that's just a start of something that i've collected i've, I've looked at over the years in, in, in fact, there are over 600 species that uh, that solely rely on it, which means that if something happens and, and our oaks are wiped out and it's happened before with things like the chestnut and things like that, then you know what? There are 600 species that will be very likely to go extinct because they don't have oaks. This is what we mean by keystone species. Lots of things depend on this one and why it's so, so important to keep especially mature oaks around because of, uh, because of their importance to what's out there and so forth. So this is the Mighty Oak. You want to learn more, read, read Doug Tallamy's book or listen to the, the, you know, the podcast I mentioned or whatever. So I won't go too much further than that, but just so you know, if you have to pick one particular plant, I'm at a loss. And so was Doug Tallamy because I basically asked him that. I'm at a loss of any other keystone species being more important for the widest amount of things than the oaks. And in this case, he was basically talking just about a few different things. I added a few things that I found from other sources. And again, if people have other things that they're aware of, if they won't, wouldn't mind letting me go, I always like to try to add to this particular slide it, uh, itself because this is only the stuff that I was able to discover from other different research that I've done on this kind of thing. So anyways, moving on. And remember, we also have you know, some 40 some different species, 42 different species of oaks. So you can probably find one that is built for that niche, that little habitat piece that you have uh, you know, in, in uh, locally. So. So again, why use natives? Again, I've mentioned a bunch of stuff and things. I want to, you know, I don't want to continuously beat this down. You get it. You, you get the whole thing, whatever. The other thing I will add, though. So a lot of times, oh, my God, I plant this thing. And now all these insects are there or whatever. People, they look at insects and they automatically think that, that uh, it's a bad thing. Oh, my God, my, you know, they, they're destroying my plants, this, that, whatever. And that's not really the case. So about half of our insects feed on plants, right? But of these... 90% uh, of the, of those half of things which feed on plants are specialists, means that they only feed on one family of different kinds of plants, okay? And that means that if you don't have that plant, much like the caterpillars, you don't have that, that, uh, you don't have that insect around anymore, okay? So 
a lot of people, they don't want to plant these things. Oh my God, I'm just going to attract all, all these insects and this, that, whatever. It is not really the case. For native insects that have come in here, they're, the ones that feed on plants are specialists. 90% of them only feed on one, you know, one family or one genus of plants themselves. And that's one important thing, okay? Okay, on to the next one. So let me go into something else that a lot of people kind of miss, and that is, so we have here in Virginia and Maryland about 400 or 450 or so species of bees, okay? Of these, many of them are specialists. In fact, depending on who you listen to, about 30% of the 450 or so species we have here, and by the way, there's about 20,000 species um, you know, worldwide, but let's just say 450 just in Virginia or Maryland, uh, they're specialists, meaning that they need certain certain species of plants, uh, of flowers, or they cannot exist. This is much like people talk about caterpillars and their host plants, and people got that, the monarch, the milkweed, all this. In reality, if you want to support bees, you got to plant the native plants because the native plants provide the pollen that they absolutely need. You don't plant the native plant, you might have something in the, in the, the bee might visit it, but in order for it to reproduce, you got to have the right kind of pollen or the right kind of nectar. In, and sometimes it, there's other parts of it too, for it to reproduce. So here, I mentioned some of these. I mentioned some of the numbers. An example of, of, of some of the different kinds are over to the back. So, and this is the problem. A lot of people, when they talk about honeybees, they just talk about honeybees. But that's not even a native animal. In reality, a lot of the work that's done with our native plants are done by the native bees. And we don't have a lot of, of them as much as before. Why? Because we have basically taken out a lot of the native plants in lieu of things like daffodils that somebody mentioned and other things like that. They don't support much. They don't support the caterpillars and they don't support the bees. Well, that's kind of a, a kind of a wasted space right there. Yes, it looks pretty to us, but at what expense? At the expense of both of many of the other insects, you know, of many other things uh, that I mentioned, bees, butterflies, not only that, but then the bats and the birds and everything else depend on them. So again, I'll leave you with this. There's a lot to this, but just so you, you get an example of some of the, um, you know, some of the di different types of illegal lectic bees that have to have the plant that they evolved with in order for them to survive. Okay, on to the next slide. Oh, actually, before that, any other questions before we move on to some of the nastier things? <laughs> yeah, we, we had a question about oaks. Dean Amel says, we planted a northern red oak 28 years ago. We're gradually moving um, out of its range. Will this reduce its value to other native species? No, there are lots of different kinds of oaks. And this is the thing. I mean, uh, we have in the past, you know, mil in millennia past, we've had these cold periods and hot periods and so forth, you know, uh, back and forth and whatever. Uh, the, the plants slowly adjust to these kinds of things and they move, they, they, they move, they, um, they're slowly conserved. So we may soon be out of range of things like the sugar maple, whatever, but there's other maples that'll still kind of grow and some animals will be adapted. Will we lose a few feces? Maybe uh, here and there, but in reality, that's kind of how it goes. These things, I am not a fan of assisted migration. We have so many plants here that even if we stop planting the things that are at the at the bottom of the range, you know, like the, the things that like sugar maples, where yes, maybe it's too hot for them or, or hemlocks or whatever, we still have so many other plants that we don't need to reach the things from Florida and Georgia. We have native plants that evolve with the stuff. And rather than wait for these other things to come in and take over, they're already here. Plant the plants that they need. They'll uh, slowly the things will shift. And again, uh, do it that way rather than you deciding you know better than mother nature and you will decide what should be in there you know and then you're you're and you've made a mistake we've made so many mistakes introducing things that did, did, did not to be introduced you know why do we need to take a chance there are so many overlapping things that even if a few species don't go here and there no big deal there are lots of other species we could plant and as the shifts in time later on the climate uh, adjusts one way or the other you know it, during the millennia these the, the uh, you know the plants will adjust and the and the insects and and so forth will will adjust with them. That's my that's my belief in how this how I think it, it should be. Anything else? All right, so folks, we're gonna look at this and let me just explain something that's kind of a a very 
sad looking, uh, kind of a sad little feature, but something I need to mention too, because it is an interconnection of how things work. So far, what we've been looking at has to do with many of the, um, has to do with many of the, the plants, which, you know, kind of depend on each other and things like that. But there are other things too. So I'm going to look here at parasites and parasitoids. There's a big difference between a parasite and a parasitoid. A parasite is something like a tick or something like that. That's a good example where, yes, it'll feed on you. And, and granted that some of them may carry disease and that would be bad. But in reality, for most ticks or whatever, they feed on you and you need that, that thing in order to survive or a mosquito and you need that for owner to survive. And there you go. But it doesn't normally kill its host. OK, that's a parasite. On the other hand, parasitoids, they always kill its host, okay? And parasitoids uh, are two examples that have over here. Uh, and many of you guys have milkweeds, may have noticed those little orange little bugs that are in there. Those are oleander aphids. And oleander, again, they introduced oleander aphids and by accident introduced this, this other aphid that few things eat, okay? And the reasons that few things eat it is because it absorbs some of the toxins from the milkweed and it makes it poisonous to eat, okay? Um, and oleander apparently has some of the same toxins uh, supplied and that's why it could it could adapt and do this um, but there are things that do feed on them and one of these would be chalcid wasps and chalcid wasps come in there sting their sting the little thing lay their egg inside and basically it's a living zombie the 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 if the if it does what it can it turns dark whatever and then at some point it stops out crawls at the little tiny chalcid uh the, the chalcid wasp to go continue the, to continue it and sting something else but in reality, if you ever see these little dark spots mixed in with all the other ones, those are mummies, and those mummy, mummies are full of little chalcid wasps on the inside. Same on the other hand. Here we have a red caterpillar, and on the back of it are, again, more chalcid wasps. Chalcid wasps here, they stung them, and what you see there are the cocoons of the emerging wasps out of there already. And I got a great video if you want to check them on mine. On, uh, if you look up, it's on... Um, uh, what is it? Now I forget the name of the. If you go to Chalcid Watch, it'll pop back on. And it's very, very interesting. You actually see them coming out of there. And basically, you know, people talk about zombies and this and that. Probably the original zombies were, was this. This is this is walking dead. This animal is doomed. There is no way it's going to survive. You could pull out all the cocoons or whatever. By the time it's got the cocoon stage, it's dead. Okay. Once it got stung, animals inside there. The ant, it'll eat all the way around it. So leaving only the internal organs it has to have to survive long enough. And that's it. But it's doomed. There's nothing you can do to save this thing. It is a zombie. And in many cases, it also changes its behavior of what it does and so forth. So again, that's what a parasitoid is. And, you know, we have parasites, we have parasitoids. Parasitoids, you know, they kill the host. Parasites, they usually do not kill the host. Um, on to the next. Next slide. So then you have two other things. So we have cuptoparasites. That means they steal food. And four, see, they get free rides. So one of the cuptoparasites, a good example would be, here are pollen mites. And pollen mites get, go on different kinds of, here, here's a mason bee, okay? This is a non-native mason bee, but regardless, the Japanese mason bee. But regardless, all those little dots on the back are mites that it picks up from going from one plant to another. And they steal the food. They live off the food. They get transportation from the bee from one place to another, whatever the case may be. But they don't kill usually the bee if you get this big of manifestation it's probably not healthy for it but it's not usually going to do it it's a cleptoparasite because it's stealing food and then you got another thing over the top there is what's called a um a, a um a, a certain kind of um uh, uh, not, not a true scorpion um it what is the name of it now now i'm forgetting the name of it it's a tailless scorpion. What is the name of it? Anyway, they're tiny. We're talking about a tiny little thing. I cannot believe I'm forgetting its name. Um, it cannot fly because it has no wings. And so what it does actually clips onto bigger insects and it takes free rides from one place to another. And that's how it gets from one location to another one. Does it hurt the animal? No, it's just getting, a, it's going along for the ride. But since it's it's so small that it would take it forever to go even you know across a room its whole life, in this case, it, it gets it get, gets on an insect, the insect flies somewhere else, and that's how it, it populates brand new areas and things like that. So kind of a neat little thing, and we do have uh, these things all around. It's just another relationship that people have that it's neither one way or the other. It doesn't really kill the animal to do this, but there are other types of relationships that exist out there, and this is just an example of both of them. Okay, on to the next one, please. So this by Jonathan Swift. So naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas than on him prey, and these have smaller still to bite them, and so proceed ad infinitum. Folks, everything has something else to feed on them. I mean, 
I, I showed you, you know, that that uh, that example over there of those tiny little insects that they're on there or whatever. We have mites that that infest different kinds of beetles. We have these little pollen mites that exist. Or that, that they're basically we have ticks. They have mites. It's the same sort of thing. And it's kind of a neat thing. Everything out there is some kind of habitat or something else for something else that's out there. So everything's part of the puzzle and that includes people. Okay. So anyways, that's just, uh, just a, a little, little piece to kind of help me remind myself of that, that we're part of the picture and everything out there is, can be available habitat for something that's out there. Okay. On to the next slide. So galls, I mentioned galls before galls are an edible home. So basically many different kinds of, uh, so, so what a gall maker does, it's, it's a certain kind of thing. It could be a wasp, a fly, a fungi, a, a virus, all these different things. And it infests its host, many of them, not just a plant, but a particular part of the plant. And then it goes in there and it, it hijacks the, the mechanism of how the plant forms. Uh, and it, it actually can be more than just plants. We'll just stick with plants here of, of how the, the plant forms, right? And so it forms these very, very interesting little structures on them. They're very specific. So every different kind of gall maker has its own particular looking little gall to it. In there, it's an edible home. It feeds on there. It's got shelter in there. It gets water in there. It's protected from everything in there. That's what the gall, That's what a gall maker does. Um, and there are tons of them out there. I already mentioned 805 just on oaks, for example. So there, there are lots of things out there. And again, I was with, uh, I was with uh, some group, uh, Actually, when we went, I'm pretty sure that we went with the, uh, with the, I, I think with Paul, remind me, when I went with the, with the, with the tree stewards this, this last weekend or something like that, we actually did find several different kinds of galls out there. And we talked about them and how, how specific they were and how they were living in there and things like that. If I'm not mistaken, we did find good examples of galls just right here in almost all of our trees. And again, if you look closely enough, especially oaks, you've got tons of them. So anyway. Galls are another different thing. You got to have the host before the gall maker can, can be in there. And interesting enough, then other things survive on there. The cherry leaf has their gall. You got to have the gall maker. And then it feeds on the gall on, on the actual home itself of the gall maker. So again, there are there are things to feed on the galls that are using the, the plant. So all sorts of different interconnections uh, out there of how these things kind of go. All right, on to the next one. So another interesting thing has to do with murmur cockery, and that's dispersal by ants. Ants, certain species of ants collect certain things on there. It's called an eliasome. And here you can see this little thing that kind of sticks off the top. That's a blood root seed. And that little thing that's, that's sticking off the top that the ant's trying to pull off is the eliasome. In some cases, it gives out different kinds of pheromones. It has lipids and proteins that they need. So the ant takes the, take the seed, uh, rips off the piece, and then he throws the seed away into their... Into their um, uh, throws the seed away into their, their basically their refuge heaps, okay? And the refuge heaps are covered in very rich material because that's where through all the trash. And so what the ant has done is it's taken the seed, took it underground, protected it in a certain area, and planted a brand new seed. And believe it or not, myrmecocri is a very big thing. It occurs worldwide, but most especially when we're in the hotbeds of myrmecocri here in the Mid-Atlantic. On to the next slide. So... So here we will see that, well, back, back one, please. Um, if we go back, just right here. So here, there may be over 11,000 worldwide. We have over 90 different kinds just around the re this region. So 30% of our, uh, of our, especially our spring wildflowers, are myrmecocris plants, meaning they have to have ants uh, or the, to, to really help it along. Some are really important, like uh, I mentioned the blood root. For some studies done locally show that if you don't have the ant rip off the blood, the liasome off of there, then the blood root doesn't produce very well. It needs the ant in order for it uh, to continue its life cycle really, really well. So here's an example of just some of, you know, the tons of different kinds of, uh, of plants around here that depend on ants. So next time you're cursing those, you know, ants at your picnic table, hey, they may be the reason why I have the spring wildflowers, okay? So don't, you know, they, they, they all are important in in life and and they're all very important about how they go about it so it's a little bit about myrmecocris plants on to the next piece and I, I i'm i'm not gonna stay here too long but this only because i have a good example of this because and i travel i just got back from el salvador what 
two weeks ago. And uh, and I found some bullhorn acacia. It's a really, really cool tree. And it's interesting. So these tiny little ants that live in there. And you see the hole. They live inside the thorns of the bullhorn acacia plant. So the thorns protect it from things like horses and cattle eating it. Um, but in reality, you don't help with like a grasshopper, or caterpillar, or something else comes there. That's where the ants themselves come in there. Because each of these ants are tiny. But as you see how their, their tails are scooped in, they have stingers. And so, you know, they love it down in El Salvador. I go visit my wife's family everything, uh, showing how little I know of nature <laughs> down there. Because, the, oh, look, they show me a thing. Oh, you want to see that? I pick it up. And, of course, they get stung by ants. And they tell me, hey, that's that's what they do. That's the bullhorn acacia ants. And this, it even produces because the plant needs the ant and the ant needs the plant. The two never survive long without each other. One has to have one or the other or the other thing dies. And because of it, it is a, a, a portrait of mutualism, meaning that they both mutually benefit. Without one, the other one is gone. And this is a very good mutualism. is, is a form of a, 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 a symbiotic uh, um, uh, symbiotic relationship and so forth. And this is a good example of it. Okay, on to the next one, please. And again, if you were to open up, this is what you see inside of it. You know, they're they're using these hollow thorns inside of the uh, of, of the things to actually raise their young. Okay, on to the next one. So ants do something very similar. So they protect different things. They farm certain things. They the ants are so 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 important. I mean, we we you know. It's a little things around the world, right? I forgot the name of the of the uh, of the, the, the scientist who who passed away, who of course studied ants for so long. But regardless, one of the interesting things to mention is ant cows. So there are aphids and thorn hoppers, leaf hoppers, and things like that. They produce honeydew, which ants just love. And so what these what the ants do is they tend them. They have at herds and these ant cows the the ants are protecting them they're moving them from place to place all of this they stroke them with their antenna and out the back end of these aphids the tree hoppers whatever out comes the honeydew that which the ants just really really love so it's a good thing the ant is protecting its livestock the ant cow and the ant cow benefits because it's being protected with things like ladybugs and things like that and whatever and this happens all over our woods all over the place tons of different kinds of of, of relationships happening to it. We learned about now myrmecochrae and how they help spread ants, how they help do these kinds of things. In this case, we can also see that they're tending other kinds of insects in order to help them as well. And, and there's many other examples of how the interrelation with ants with many other things, but I'm not gonna spend any more time on this. On to the next one, please. And again, Aldo Leopold, the first rule of intelligent tinkering, don't lose any of the pieces. And the bad news is we're losing pieces left and right. And we have to realize if we will continue to lose pieces, we will preserve lands, we continue to build. And more importantly, if us not being good neighbors don't realize that there are these interconnections and plant native plants to really help benefit wildlife. Because otherwise you can plant all the plants you want to. We don't plant the right plant, that bee doesn't exist. We don't plant the right plant, that caterpillar doesn't exist. And so forth and so on. So we have to be very, very careful. And these non-natives won't help us. What will help us are plenty of native plants that they evolve with. Okay, next one. So one example. So here we have toothworts. Toothworts really cool. And this is what happens when you introduce an invasive species, garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is terrible. It's a two-year plant. Um, you know, people introduce it as a food plant, whatever. It's allelopathic, so it prevents other things from a germinating. So already by itself, it's a bad plant to have. I mean, it 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 slowly uh, you know takes over our area and keeps our native plants reproducing. Now, you flip forward and some other unintentional stuff. That's the West Virginia white. Looks like our cabbage white, but it's a very low flying type of thing, very low to the ground. There's not a lot of, uh, a lot of markings or whatever on the, on the butterfly itself. And it feeds on toothworts. So it lands on a toothwort, as I mentioned before, drums it with its feet, tastes the oils, okay, the mustard oils, and say, oh, this is a toothwort. It's got mustard oils. I'll lay my egg there. Except garlic mustard also has mustard oils. Lands on there. Taste it, ah, mustard oils, I'll lay my egg there. Except the garlic mustard is not a toothwort. And when they lay their eggs on the garlic mustard, the butterfly dies. As garlic mustard is slowly spread into an area, not only is it slowly outcompeting our natives, it's also killing off the West Virginia white butterfly. Just one example of why you do not want to introduce native species and things like that. This was introduced for good reasons. It has some medicinal properties, it's edible, whatever. The bad news is, in unintentionally, you're killing off wildlife and outcompeting with the native plants that other animals need. On to the next one. So 
not going to go into it, but many different kinds of things. Many but um, hummingbirds evolved looking for long tubular flowers. Many of them are red and so forth. Lots of like, different nature. And when you may be planting, quote unquote, for hummingbirds, you can see all the other things that benefit too. Like, for example, the, the, the azaleas. You plant in, you know, one of our native azaleas. And then you got 50 other caterpillars that can really uh, uh, that can really depend on them too, including many of the hummingbird moths that really feed on them too. On to the next one. So I mentioned goldenrods as an example of all of them. One of the big things, 115 caterpillars, but more importantly, seven different kinds of illegal lectic, uh, of illegal lectic bees, meaning that they have to have, um, they have to have this uh, goldenrod or they cannot reproduce. In fact, some of them, uh, Andrina solignag solignagnus, solidago is the genus for goldenrods. It's so important that it's even part of its scientific name because without it, you can't have it. On top of everything else, there's 16 bugs, 9 aphids, 7 free aphids, all sorts of things. The 50 different kinds of gall makers, a very important keystone plant, but in this case, it's not a tree. It's a, you know, it's it's a smaller plant. And again, there's tons of them. We have over 40 species in Virginia, so there are some that grow, that will grow regardless of what kinds of conditions you have around your yard. Okay, on to the next one. Just an example of a few of them. On to the next one. And asters, same thing, 42 different species in Virginia, tons of different animals feed on them, 120, 112 caterpillar species, different kinds of bees, including eight, they're illegal lectic. Another very, very great plant that you need to plant in order to, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that benefits all sorts of different kinds of wildlife. On to the next one. So wild strawberries, and this is where you get edible landscaping. You can plant it because it's great food. Um, and so forth. It's not, this is carefree. This is going in my driveway. Look at the cracks in my driveway where it's going from, right? And, but when I plant it, I actually don't eat very many because one, the birds get them, the chipmunks get them. And unfortunately, neighborhood kids, thanks to my son, um, you know, way back when he kind of taught them. But 81 caterpillar species, 53 different kinds of bees, one bee specialist, and these are bees, and tons of mammals. A perfect little thing. And by the way, many of these things, if you look up on my YouTube channel, things like that, you can find out more about these things. On to the next one. Sanctuary of service berries, widely planted. It's an aesthetic plant, beautiful to plant and so forth. But again, tons of birds, 42, 100 different, 24 different kinds of caterpillars, 24 different kinds of mammal species, tons of pollinators. And here, here's some in my yard. And I, I collect, you know, I collect, uh, you know, I, I, I like to eat the, like to eat the June berries out of it every year too. So this is edible landscaping. You supply it me because it's a beautiful tree. You supply it because it may be you want to eat the fruits, but in reality, you're helping out wildlife at the same time. You can do more than one thing just because you're trying to do, you know, one thing you can, you can accomplish so much more. On to the next one. Violets, again, let them grow because when you have in there another bee specialist, you have, again, 30 different kinds of caterpillars. So if you see violets in your yard, that's okay. You don't have to be, you know, super clean, having a great lawn, because lawns don't feed anything, Okay but violets do. So let the violets grow when you find them. On to the next one. Wild grapes. A lot of people hey, get rid of the grapes, this, that, whatever, and really porcelain berry is bad and it does cause lots of things, but not really grapes. They evolve with what we have out there. There are 79 different kinds of caterpillars. Over a hundred species of birds feed on the different kinds of grapes. Okay, so it's very, very important. And since it's evolved with lots of our types of stuff, in general, on a healthy tree, grapes are not going to do anything. They don't constrict their way around it. They don't, um, you know, they don't girdle the trees. They don't do that kind of stuff. They basically looking, uh, basically like a scaffolding to basically carry it from one little tree to another as it spreads through the woods. So wild grapes, again, um, you know, are an important thing. And I encourage people that when you see them out there, try to learn the difference between porcelain berry, which grows very, very fast, and wild grapes, the difference. I think we have 12 different local species that are wonderful to have around. Okay, on to the next one. I apologize, I'm going a little bit long. Joe Pies, whatever, tons of different butterfly plants. This is one of them. You plant it because it's beautiful to look at, whatever, but you're also feeding not just pollinators like this, like our state butterfly, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, but also 41 different caterpillars that are also coming to visit it. Okay, next one, please. Oh, well, that didn't come out too well, but you guys know what red maple looks like. I don't know why that, I know why, because I was messing with this, this thing even earlier today, and I obviously, I didn't do this one really well, but lots of neat things about it. it, it it's one, um, it, it, it's a, it, uh, it, it's a, it's a kind of plant 
that is another keystone species. Um, it's out there um, and it's a, uh, not only is it pretty to look at, it's a plant a lot, but in reality, you're looking at something uh, that can live for quite a long time, you know, 150 years, whatever. Uh, it's been used by people the longest time, 297 different kinds of caterpillars to feed on it. And red maple is interesting because not only is it deer assist, an important thing to have these days, as we know we have an overpopulation of deer in Arlington, um, but the other type of thing is it's both wind pollinated um, and insect pollinated. But again, another reason that it's all over the place, it's probably the most adaptable of our different trees that we have. But um, but one of the things that it that, that also helps it along is that deer will eat deer candy, but they tend to leave the red maples alone. Okay, on to the next one. Dogwoods, tons of different species. You know, it's it's our state flower, our state our, our state tree. Ninety eight different kinds of birds. It be the, the droops on there. Wonderful proteins and lipids. They it has foliar flagging means that it turns red at the same time as the berry as the berries as the droops themselves. So even though it's a small tree, birds in migration can see it coming in there and partake of it. The bad news is we have introduced some Tusa dogwood, one of our uh, non-native species. We accidentally drew some tracnos, a fungi. And the fungi has been wiping out several of our different kinds of, of uh, you know, dogwood, especially because the bird lands on it. They carry the spores as they continue migration to other healthy populations and so forth. For a long time, people had wanted to give up on planting dogwoods as, oh, my God, they're dying or whatever. Don't plant them anymore. Thank goodness that we did not do that. People continue to plant them or whatever. And that's good because there were some that seemed to be resistant to it. Some of them are surviving and so forth. And that's something else. This is a question that was asked of Talamy. He says, you know, they say, oh, well, ash trees. Well, many jurisdictions aren't planting ash trees anymore. That's probably the wrong way to go about it because maybe you want to at least allow them to grow in the woods out in the, there or plant small little trees where you pack them all together because in a few years it survives. It's still supporting all the wildlife that, uh, that ashes support. But if we give up on them, then you know what? We're not going to have them around, and all the insects that and, and wildlife that depend on them will disappear. The good thing is flowering dogwood now, there are, are some resistant, uh, resistance to them and are starting to come back again. And that's kind of a very good, um, you know, that's kind of a very good thing uh, for it to happen is to not give up on them. And again, Tug Talmy says, don't give up on ashes, okay? We give up on ashes, and then we give up the fight. We're not going to have, we're not going to have them anymore, okay? On to the next one. We're almost done, folks. I apologize. I've been talking a little bit too long. So we talked about flying dogwood, and again, this is just the tons of animals feed on it. No need to, 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 to delve any more about them. It's so important, and you can see why. Just the number of caterpillars and birds to feed on these different kinds of things. And I got to go back and fix this, obviously, because it doesn't help you if you can't see pictures. Next one, please. So golden ragwort's one that I mentioned. And again, it's an evergreen ground cover. Great for replacing things such as, uh, for example, English ivy and whatever, which climbs the trees, provides all sorts of moisture on there that can uh, that can also um, invite less than ideal fungi, uh, fungal uh, sources, acts as like a sail to help knock down trees, overweighs the trees, or whatever. So this is a good one. But on top of everything else, not only is it a pretty evergreen ground cover, but it's got 18 different species of caterpillars to feed on it. So a good plant to plant um, in an area if you want a, an evergreen ground cover. Next one, please. Elderberries, tons of neat things about elderberries, 120 different kinds of birds, okay, that like to use them. It only feeds 42 caterpillars. That's still pretty darn good. Uh, and a lot of different things live on, including inside the, the it's got a, it's got hollow pith. And because of hollow pith, many uh, carpenter bees, especially serotina, which is the little small carpenter bees, tiny little ones, there's are tiny little things, live inside of them, which is why the woodpeckers come and use them quite a bit. It is an edible food, although you don't want to cook it, whatever it is. And now if you were to go, into like a Walgreens or CVS, you will see that they're they're actually selling uh, elderberry um, uh, uh, substances or sambuca, sometimes they call it that, because we found that that it's very good uh, uh, antiviral and things like that. So another plant that that's planted. I remember the Walking Dead it was a whole a whole thing where they used elderberry to kind of save you know the survivors <laughs> like they were undergoing what looked like a a, a certain type of flu. On to the next one. So with that, I'll wrap it up. I apologize, I, I did go over. But again, this is a very, very fast look at what's a fascinating type of thing. Um, and I and I strongly encourage you guys that this is just a, a short little, um, this is just a short little look at this. Obviously we, we barely covered, just scratched the surface on them. But 
what I find out is when you go down one little avenue, you ask more questions, you continue on to, to, to other different uh, other different things as well. And I'm hoping that this kind of opened up your eyes to just a few of the different things. And I'm not, I'm not expecting everyone to all of a sudden only plant native plants and don't do this or whatever. However, don't plant invasives. Please at least do that. And top of everything else, if you make enough space for natives, the wildlife benefits, you, you benefits, you could be a good neighbor. And again, the only way that really survives out there, it's not by preserving little parklands, whatever, because there's not enough of them. The only way that wildlife can survive is if they, we all become good neighbors and plant some native plants uh, so that uh, that they can use that in lieu of all the all the different kinds of parklands which are disappearing. All right, with that, I'm done. So unless you guys have any questions, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you guys. Uh, you're on mute. We have a few questions in the chat. Well, we're um, out of time. I'm really sorry. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, one of the questions was, um, um, you know, if an oak tree dies, um, is it better to leave the stump uh, or to drill it out? Is there any value to yes. leaving the stump? There is. And standard practice and protocol for what we do in, in Arlington is, we try to leave snags. Snags are these, you know, standing trees. You cut off the snag, usually it's 20 feet or something, uh, at a certain level. So knowing that if it's going to fall, it's not going to hit anything. So you have to take that into account. But you top it off at that. You leave the wood in the forest. The reason being that it, it decomposes, but also underneath it is wonderful habitat, you know, for salamanders and all sorts of frogs, whatever, underneath the logs themselves. And the snags, you'll see the woodpeckers chipping in and out of them. Uh, using them too, and and that then is it feeds not just the birds, but also feeds the other insects that all go in there too. So standard practice for Arlington County is to leave the snags and to leave the wood where we find it. Me chip it if it's you know on a trail or something like that. But that's standard practice for us because it does help with wildlife. Um, one of our listeners asked if service berries are edible if they have the cedar rust. If somebody actually answered. They yeah, they really, they really aren't that edible. In fact, the birds aren't crazy about them either. So here's the thing. I have in my yard, it's very seasonable. So like what, like this year was a great year. I don't know what it was about it, but uh, uh, probably, probably had to do with rain, right? Uh, it was not very good for spores. And even though I know my neighbors, I can see from my yard, I can see the cedars. And not only that, I can also see hawthorns in one of my other neighbor's yards or whatever. Um, and you know what? I had really good production. It all really depends on the weather. And some years you get really good um, things. And other times you get mummy berries, you get, you know, you get the, uh, the, the fungi and then it's not that edible anymore, but I have enough good years to make up for the bad years and I'm happy with it. Yeah. Someone, uh, I guess it was uh, Rebecca commented that while you shouldn't eat European elderberries raw, that she, she says that American elderberries are fine to eat raw, but it, it, uh, it really depends. There are people. So everyone's different. OK, folks, that that that's one of those things. Um, so we have well, not that we have locally. We have two different kinds of regional um, um, elderberries. But this thing, some people have a bad reaction to them regardless. Other people don't. And you won't know until you have it. It's not going to kill you anything, but it can upset your stomach. So the bottom line is, um, you know, it, if you are going to do something with it or whatever like that, it may be wise to prepare it in such a way or make wine out of it. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but uh, like I said, it, there, it, it, a lot of people react differently to it. I, like there's lots of, of uh, caterpillars and for whatever, you know, uh, maybe because I'm Latino or something like that, the, the joke or, around here with, with even my, uh, with the family, because I'm outside, so I'm on top of lizard skin, okay? I have me after I don't put sunblock on anything like that. I'm fine, right? Same thing with caterpillars. I can touch them, not a problem. Even those that are known to be, uh, urticating hairs that have the hairs that can sting for other people doesn't bother me. Somebody else touches them, that's a different story. So everyone's different. So you have to do anything that you do, you have to do with a grain of salt. Will it affect me or not? Don't assume it won't because we're not all the same. I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned all these studies with very precise numbers of how many caterpillars a particular tree or bush hosts. Who does this research Doug and how County. do they manage to come up with such precise so, uh, counts? It's Doug Callamy and what he did, and that's what you have when you have an army of grad students, right? You get your army of grad students and one, they do 
literature reviews to find out what it is and then uh, and to find out, okay, this says that this one used it, whatever. And if it's, re and if it's reviewed in more than one place that it says that this is the host plan for this, they can assume what it is. Or, um, you know, they do research in order to find out if it is or isn't what it is, what it is. And that's what happens. We have an army of, of, uh, of grad students doing this. It's kind of funny because my original slide early on uh, actually has a different number for the final caterpillar count. Okay. The, why? Because the original numbers that came out from Doug Tallamy early on was I think 30 or whatever caterpillars less. Later on, he added to the number because more and more, re more and more literature was found that proved that this was what it was. But that's what happens when you have, you know, you have a bunch of grad students doing the work for you. Well, thank you for that very uh, enlightening talk. Are there any other questions before we uh, close down? No. Oh, folks. Yes, go ahead, Tori. Well, please uh, 